Okay, cool. So we got a lot of new people today. Uh, our class is unapologetic. It's just like Will's class, if you guys have been to that. Um, right now, we're doing common objections to the faith, and we're um, taking different topics, subtopics under that. Um, right now, we're going to do seeming contradictions in the Bible. So, um, yeah, I think, okay, we've got them right here. These are all of our topics. We're going to go through some genealogies that don't match, uh, the rooster crowing once versus two times, Judas hanging himself, if he can see God or not, and uh, maybe if we have time, we'll do if God can change his mind or not. Um, so, ask me before we start, maybe we should pray, and then yeah, can yeah, go on. Great. All right. Um, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you that we can all gather here today with our church family and uh, learn a little deeper about you, um, learn some things that maybe aren't normally talked about in church so that we can strengthen our faith and um, have a better understanding of who you are, Lord. Just need to pray. Amen. 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 Um, all right, so you want to just get, get going? Yeah. Get going. Um, again, something to keep in mind, generally when you're confronted with something that's a seeming contradiction in the Bible, uh, it's not always in good faith. <laughs> Let's put yeah. it that way, right? Uh -huh. So oftentimes it's not someone who's genuinely trying to search for the answer. Rather, it's someone who is trying to just say, ha, gotcha, right? And so it's important to keep that in mind. It's not always the case, but it's important to keep that in mind when you're discussing some of this stuff with people um, and just work with them, but also try to steer it towards being a productive conversation around the Bible, its historicity, its authenticity, etc. Right? Yeah, I've actually kind of gone off of that idea. I've kind of found apologetics almost more helpful for Christians than for non-Christians because <laughs> I think there's very few people that are really hung up on like the historicity of the Bible or can God really exist. A few yeah. people are and are genuine, ready to have conversations. But um, a lot of times they come at us trying to disprove our faith, right? So yeah. we should be able to take a stand on that like Paul says as well. Yeah, so exactly. A lot of times if someone comes to you with something like this, they're, they probably haven't researched it completely. Right, yeah. Let's just put it that way. Uh -huh. so. um, and I'm sure going into it, neither of us think there are contradictions in the Bible, so that's yeah, <laughs> kind yeah. of whatever we're yeah. going to do here. So. All right, so I'm um, just going to jump into it then. Mm -hmm. for, for genealogies in the Bible, I think this is a pretty interesting topic because um, I don't think people really think about how this isn't as important as we should think it is, <laughs> all right? Yeah. So um, genealogy is it's a big deal for multiple reasons. Um, but the, the biggest reason is because Christians historically have put a lot of weight on genealogies, all right? Mm -hmm. So um, how many of you guys have heard that the Earth is like 6,000 years old? Um, the creation idea of it being 6,000 years. So the reason why we say it's 6,000 years is because there was a... Um, historian in the Middle Ages, I can't remember his name, because I'm blanking on it, but he took all the genealogies in the Bible, and he basically just traced it up to modern day. It's about 6,000 years, right? Or yeah. if we're gonna go to when that. you add all ages and about the age that someone would be when they had... Right, yeah, and you have to have averages in there, because not all of the, the, you know, when people died and when people were born, right? But it's gonna be roughly around 6,000 years. So, because of that, that's gotten really hooked into the um, historicity of the Bible, like if we can find gaps in um, genealogies and maybe the Bible isn't in there and all these sorts of things, right? So the question that we're actually should be asking is not, um, is this, you know, are all these genealogies right? Is that when people were reading the genealogies in the day, what were they trying to prove? Right? So sure. It's a very distinct, different question. Okay? So what is the purpose of listing gene genealogies as opposed to assuming they're complete? Right, exactly. So as you can see pretty quickly when you start looking at genealogies in the Bible, is they're not complete, right? And they, they're not straight comparisons of each other. So the, the easiest ones to go to, we have Genesis, Chronicles, Matthew, and Luke. Um, Matthew, when compared to Genesis and Chronicles, skips over like four generations. We can see it pretty easily, right? Um, so Matthew 1.8 skips Isaiah. Uh, I mean, you guys can just read those names. That's a lie. No idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, who are kings of Judah and well-documented. Something we also think about when we're reading about the disciples is that these were like uneducated fishermen, which compared to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were, right? But these were still very educated people. I mean, Jews yeah. back in that time were very educated in, in the Torah. Torah so, class and such, yeah. Right, had yeah. to memorize it. They, yeah, they memorized it, right? So Matthew would not have missed that. So that most likely means, or, and people would have known who he would have missed, that that wasn't his intention. Though, ironically, Matthew of all disciples 
might have been the worst at it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially compared to like Luke, maybe who's sure one of the best historians to ever live. Um, but so that that is one of the main reasons why we should say that genealogies aren't meant to be every single person. What they're trying to do is probably trace the language, right? So. So for the creationists, there's actually quite the implication there is that 6,000 years is not like set in stone number, right? I'm not saying that I agree with creationism or that the creationists or the creationists are wrong. I'm just saying 6,000 years does not need to be set in stone, right? So um, I've heard many creationists that will say it's probably between six and 20,000 years, right? It's still very young if you can hold that view, but like we don't need to go right to the genealogy to say how old the earth is, right? That's kind of the point there. Um, does anyone have any questions on that? Because I know that was just a tidbit. I'd love to get into that more. But you know, okay. So the the hardest genealogies that we have in the Bible, because if we're all going to be in this here, we think that the Bible is true in every word, is the genealogies for um, from Jesus compared to Matthew and Luke. They're they're really just completely different genealogies, right? Um, you even have the father of Joseph is just two different people in Matthew and Luke, and the whole entire line is different. So um, we're going through this quickly as a survey of this, but I want to show that this is not a contradiction, but there's probably a reason why there's two different genealogies. Um, one is a possible but probably unlikely answer would be that um, there are two different genealogies from, um, from one from Mary and one from Joseph. Right, so they would say Luke was explaining the genealogy from Mary's line while um, Matthew was explaining it from Joseph. So the reason people think this is a good explanation is in ancient Judaism, this was a practice of tracing the line from matriarchs. The issue with that is it didn't start until the second century. So it's very unlikely that this is what they were doing here. Second century yeah. AD? Second century AD. Uh -huh. So they don't really have matriarchal tracing of genealogies before then, at the time when these were written. Or at least no evidence of. <laughs> Yeah, right, so maybe they did exist and we just haven't found manuscripts, right? So that's why it is a valid argument. It's not a contradiction if we can find valid arguments against it. Um, the second one, which is, I think is a much stronger argument, was that Matthew was tracing the Davidic line, right? Trying to show that Jesus came from the Davidic line also would make sense why he would skip over kings, which he's just trying to prove the point that he came from the Davidic line. Whereas AKA, everyone knows this. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Everyone knows that these are the people that came from this line, so we don't really need to explain every single person in between. And they yeah. weren't great anyways, so. <laughs> yeah. Just going back to the two genealogies, mm -hmm. are they accurate for a line of Mary and a line of Joseph? So, I mean, I, like we wish we Theoretically? Yeah, right. It's, we don't really know, because, I mean, I think that we often think that we have tons of uh, different sources where we can track genealogies from that time. I mean, the reality is, like, I think we have like 10 source documents that Plato even existed. You know what I mean? So a lot of these characters that we're talking about this long ago, um, there's not much to go off of that they were really real. That's why people will often say, you know, the Bible is not trustworthy because we don't have very many documents. But the answer to that is, well, we have way more documents of the Bible than anything else in history. I mean, we know... And specifically the New Testament. Specifically the New but Testament. But the Old Testament as well. Yeah. At the same time, someone like Mary, she kind of, God kind of just plucked her out of nowhere. Oh, I yeah, mean, good point. She was yeah. very specific, of course. Yeah. But at the same time, it's difficult to know whether, and if Luke isn't going to just say... This is Mary's line. Yeah, yeah, nobody, there's not going to be anyone tracing <laughs> Mary's line anywhere in history as well. So it's a great question, but the unfortunate answer is we just don't have much documentation of that time period in general. So, I mean, it makes sense like, when the Romans would take someone over, they just burn everything. You know, I mean, the Library of Alexandria is a classic example of the, when the um, barbar barbarians came and destroyed the Roman, or the Byzantine Empire, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah, that's unfortunate, but it's true. Um, <laughs> So the, the, the stronger argument, I think, from that is the tracing the two lines where Matthew is talking about the Davidic line, um, where Luke is presenting an actual physical line, right, of like, the actual people. So you're going um, to have discrepancies there. And then another good argument, just for the sake of time, kind of skipping through it, is that um, there's what's called a Levitical marriage, where if someone would die, um, the half-brother or the brother of someone would marry the wife to take care of them, right? I think we all are familiar with that in the Old Testament. So um, it's likely that since the two fathers of Joseph were different, that, that one of those is a biological dad of Joseph and one of them is a political dad of Joseph, right? And then that would account for the different genealogies as well. Um, 
really not a huge deal for these genealogies specifically because they were written about the same time in history. So you're also going to have people, especially the Pharisees and Sadducees, who, who deeply wanted to discredit these religions as they were popping up. And it's not really much of an issue that we see in history either, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but that brings us to, I think, most to important parts for our purposes today is what were the purpose of genealogies and what are the implications of genealogies? So like I said, we don't really want to get stuck on the earth as it has to be exactly 6,000 years old. I'm not saying creationism is not a viable option, like Corey it will, will argue very well in his classes it is. It's just that if it's 20,000 years, it's kind of like, eh. You know, <laughs> it doesn't have to be 6,000 years. Yeah. Um, and then the point of genealogy is, is not to give an account of time period. Right, it's to account for something like the Davidic line. Yeah, <coughs> which of course is prophetical, and so, you know, Jesus being the Messiah, you need additional evidence of that. Well, his parents come from the Davidic line, which is prophesied, exactly. right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions on genealogies, comments? No? I heard from someone else that like the purpose of Matthew documenting the gene gene genealogy was to telegraph certain theological points. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, yeah, for that. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like uh, in verse 17, Matthew 1 and 17, he says there's 14 generations between Abraham to David and 14 generations to the exile and 14 generations to now. It's kind of unlikely that there's exactly 14 generations. Oh, right. Matthew probably mm -hmm. knows that, but he wants to highlight those people yeah. in your mind and he wants to associate David and Abraham with Jesus. Right, yeah, yeah right. That's a great point. Good point, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I heard from someone say that um, the purpose of gene genealogies is begetting, so to say, you know, that that was like in the line, right? Like we don't need to say, and we actually see it frequently in Chronicles especially, mm -hmm. they'll say like this was the son of X or X was the son of Y, and there's like three generations in there. And it's true that he was in that line, but he's not actually the son. So um, we see that all throughout the ancient Near East and in other genealogies as well. I was looking at Wikipedia, and which probably isn't the most Christian-friendly site, right? <laughs> and they're like, it's not, like, this is very consistent with other religions. That this is just how people documented back then. You know, only we document with the precision that we do today because of the resources that we have. Yeah. So. so, well, we'll go on to our next one if no one has any. Uh, cool. Okay. So, yeah, this is all about the rooster crowing. Um, it's a notable difference between uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where Mark says that, uh, well, Jesus says, hey, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times to Peter, whereas Matthew, Luke, and John all say before the rooster crows. Um, so what's going on there? Like, is it, are they compatible or not? And this is, kind of gets into another purpose thing, when you think about the Gospels and why we have four versions of the same good news, why would we have four versions of it? Why wouldn't God just write the perfect first version? <laughs> and the answer to that is a little interesting. So instead of it really being about the good news, which of course it is, the reason why we have four is just different audiences. Um, and so someone like Mark, very much uh, it's, it's possible, he's potentially more detail-oriented in this specific aspect, whereas everyone else, Matthew, Luke, John, um, aren't. <laughs> They're getting to the point of it, which is, of course, uh, that Jesus predicts Peter, uh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, Jesus predicts that Peter will deny him three times, and of course, that's what happened. Um, so, yeah, uh, let's see here. Yeah, so once again, they're writing a history, like a record of what happened, but not necessarily all presented in the same manner as what we have today. Instead, it's a little more topical, a little more relational, and a little more, obviously, what the audience is expecting. Because that's the thing. If the Gospels were written in a perfect, accurate, precise manner, but they weren't suitable for their audience... Christianity w wouldn't have gone anywhere, right? You can have the most truth, but if you don't present it in a way that your audience will accept it, it's just not going to work. And so that's what happens here. In fact, John is the most annoying to reference for this because in John 13, that's where Jesus makes his prediction. 
And then later on, in two separate places, is when Peter denies him. <laughs> and so, of course, uh, you know, the prophecy is only fulfilled at the very end. And it's like, this is a, a, a good time to note, hey, he's going through the narrative here. He's talking about all the things that are happening all at once, all together, and he's bringing this along with him. Um, and so it's very much, and you see the same type of thing with timelines, right? Where, well, what happened first? Was it this or that or the other thing, right? Did Jesus turn the water to wine as like his very first miracle or was it later on? Um, and the answer is a lot of times it's not particularly relevant to what the gospel authors were trying to communicate. Instead, they're giving their personal account similar to how someone would give a personal account, say, in an interrogation in a uh, police station or whatever, where you go topically, you don't necessarily go chronologically. Now, of course, officers can ask for that. Well, hey, when did that happen? When did that happen? But when you're writing a book, um, <laughs> you don't always have that. So, yeah. I have a great argument with that point um, from a, another great book called it on the Faith of an Atheist. If any of you are looking for a good apologetic book, and Trice is listening to that now. Yeah. Um, and Eight hours left. Yeah, nice. <laughs> it's great. I got I listened to it like two weeks. It's, it's great book. But um, it, um, they say that if if the Bible is real and you don't have people that are just trying to make for religion for the sake of like power or something, that we would actually have slight like, discrepancies between the two accounts because that's exactly what Cal said. People have different intentions and they're writing different passages, right? So um, maybe one would be topical and one would be chronological and. Uh, that's a very strong argument for of corroborating evidence, which is probably some of the strongest evidence we have in inductive reasoning in general. So. Yeah, and this is why so many, um, like, his, um, I don't know about historians, but uh, Bible scholars today prefer Luke's version because yeah. he makes it very clear that he's trying to be a historian like many Greeks were at the time, as opposed to storytellers like Matthew or John, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, then, you know, a couple questions about this, like, you know, it, are like Matthew, Luke, and John wrong to not include twice? Obviously, when we say, when they're saying the rooster crowed, they don't specify how many times, right? So it's just, it's just compatible there. Um, there's nothing about like, well, you know, the rooster crowed uh, only once. It can only happen once, you yeah. know, <laughs> throughout the day or, uh, ha you know, definitely had to be at least, you know, two times sort of thing. Um, they're just not concerned with that particular detail. And then, of course, how would this affect your particular view of the inspiration of Scripture? Um, if you believe that God dictated every single word to someone, you might be more inclined to see this as an actual contradiction in the Bible. Of course, at the same time, there's reasoning around that, which is there's different audiences, different purposes for this. Um, and it's not always a necessary detail. So, okay. does anyone have any questions about that? No. There's a really good book. Um, you heard of J. Warner Wall? He I was a sure. cop who essentially went through the gospel and like the four mm -hmm. different accounts makes yep. sense because if you have eyewitness accounts, even four people witnessing the same exact thing, each account will be just different by a little bit yep. because they're emphasizing different things, they remember different things, all that yep. takes into account. Yeah. Exactly. So his book, I think, Cold Case Christianity, really okay. emphasizes this and goes yeah. through the Gospels. So. Yep. Another great book that I recommend is called uh, Testimonies to the Truth by Dr. Lydia McGrew. And she takes a similar approach to it. She goes through the Gospels and talks about the unexplained, you know, like uh, where their stories all align in an unexplained manner, where uh, they have details, unnecessary details that also are factually accurate and also happen to align with each other. Very interesting, so, okay. Oh, seeing God. I thought this was coming next. So I'm oh. ready for it, so I got it. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> um, so, seeing God is a pretty interesting one because there seems to be just straight contradictions for seeing God in the Bible, right? Um, I'm gonna read two of them right now, and as like I said before, we're all inerrantists here, so we believe that there can't be contradictions in the Bible. If there is a logical contradiction, like saying, um, you know, the, the, the golden calf was made out of gold, and then another account says it was made out of silver. Uh, one of those has to be wrong. And if the Bible is truly an errant, that can't happen in the Bible, right? So this is an example of one that does seem like a real contradiction. So like Callum was saying earlier, if someone says, well, the cop crowed, 
And then someone said, well, the cock crowed cro cro twice. Like, those can both be true, right? I mean, it did crow when it crowed twice. So, <laughs> but um, in this one, we have Genesis 32, 30. Um, so, it's, so Jacob called the place Penal, saying, um, for I have seen the face, or God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. And then in uh, John 1, 18, it says, no one has ever seen God. It is God, only the Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has been made to him known, um, or made him known. So, so what is that, right? Have, can we see God or can we not see God? <laughs> because, uh, those are those are two contrary things. Another account in the Old Testament it says if you see God, you'll die. Um, so I think the the best way to to go through this um, question is actually a discussion base. So I'm going to ask you guys a few questions, and people are willing to participate. Hope you do. Um, except for Pastor Banks, you're literally teaching on this today, and you already know the answer. So, <laughs> um, so my first question is, where is God? Like, if we're going to start talking about. Um, you know, can we see God, can we not see God? We first need to get to the question of where God actually is. So does anyone know where God is? He's everywhere. He's everywhere, right? So does that mean he's in creation? Is he actually like a part of this table? Is he a part of the creation over here? Or is he separate from creation? Julia. Oh. <laughs> Separate from creation, exactly, right? So some people would think that God, since that he's everywhere, he's in the things he's here. Actually, it says that Jesus, specifically the Son in the Trinity, holds everything together. So he's greater, he's transcendent than creation. But that brings up a pretty big question of then, well, where is God? He's, if he's everywhere, but he's not actually anywhere, then, then where is he? Um, I also asked this class, or this question in the class I taught the high schoolers last year, and um, they gave a good answer, which is God is in heaven. Um, and I think we all know that as well. Like God is in heaven, but God is also omnipresent. So is he more in heaven than he is on earth? That's an actual question. What do you guys think? Equally. Equally. But then, can you see God more in heaven than you can on earth? Or can you be in his presence more in heaven than you are on earth? Not necessarily. Not necessarily? What do you mean? <coughs> Well, it, it, so God is omnipresent, uh -huh. and, and it's not just that he's, he's more here or more there. He's completely everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's not that 10% that is in heaven and 20% you know, is here and 30% right. is over there. It, it, it's 100% everywhere. He's not divisible, absolutely. So, but. so it, it's a matter of, 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 really, it's a matter of what we're seeing. It's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of of the dimension that, that we're, we're allowed to see. Perfect. So that's that's the key, is what we're seeing of God, right? So, because we even talk about God's presence being in the tabernacle, right? So does that mean he wasn't present elsewhere? You know, I mean, people could pray to God outside and they could hear God. So it's a very complicated question, and what it really boils down to is something that's called one of God's incommunicable attributes, which means that we can't really understand it because we're not God, right? So, so for a finite being, God is not finite. It's not something that we can physically understand because we can't relate to it in the same way that God can. Mm -hmm. um, what we can know is that he is spirit, but he can also make himself manifest in different ways at different times. Theologians, theologians I'm sorry, call this theophany. Um, it's a very fancy term just for what I said there. <laughs> and, um, is it like a theological epiphany? Yeah, yeah it sounds like that, right? <laughs> theological epiphany. Um, so, like you were actually saying in Jeremiah, um, the Jeremiah... 23, 23 through 24 says, I'm a God nearby. I'm a not near God, God nearby, says the Lord, and not a God far away who can hide in secret places I cannot see them to kill us the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, so, so to kind of bring this into a practical application is that when, when Jacob saw God, he did see God, but he didn't see him in his full presence. Right? That would literally kill you. The only place that we will see God in his full presence and we'll really truly see him face to face is when we die and we're in heaven. So the answer to is God on earth or is he in heaven is yes, he's in both, and he's in both completely, but his presence is more fully known in heaven than it is on earth. It has to be, because we would die. <laughs> we saw that great glory there. Mm -hmm. So, um, not a super um, clear answer, that one that we can understand, but if we could understand everything of the Bible, um, God would not exist, because if God is real and he's actually as great as we say he is, there's not a chance we'd understand him. If we did understand him, we, he wouldn't be God. So, yeah. Any questions? It, oh, sorry, it, sorry. Because all his attributes apply across all those sort of things. So including logic, right? His logic is greater than our own. So if we could fully understand him through logic, then his logic wouldn't actually be greater than ours. 
Right. Yeah. Therefore, he wouldn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. And even just a lot of inductive reasoning as yeah. opposed to deductive reasoning for people that know that is based on experience, and we just can't experience life the way that God experiences it. So. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Cool. Any questions about that? I think just one thing about God's presence. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the attributes of God and thinking about his presence being everywhere, mm -hmm. it's interesting to see how his presence interacts differently in different places. Right. And so sure. when you look at scripture, his presence can do three things. It can either bless, curse, or just Absolutely. hold together. Mm -hmm. And so in heaven, God's presence is completely blessing, whereas you know in our day-to-day, -day, his presence is mostly just holding together, existing, but then where God is present, also in the place of the dead. Hell, his presence is now cursing, yeah. if we think about it. And so that's something not many Christians even think about. Mm -hmm. His presence is everywhere, but it's not doing the same thing in all the places that it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's good. Cool, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, now another one that we hear a lot is about Judas hanging himself. And... Uh, it's kind of interesting, as I was reading through, I realized there's not just one thing, but two different things uh, going on. So, first off, Matthew says Judas went and hanged himself, while Acts, on the other hand, says, falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and his bowels gushed out. Not great. Um, and also so contradictions, seemingly. Yeah, so that one is like, well, which happened? Did he hang himself, or, or did that happen? And that's very similar. Oh, do you want to say something? Wait, I was the understand I got it, it after Judas hanged himself mm -hmm. he fell from the rope and when he hit the ground yep. his insides burst out. Right. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so <laughs> they are pretty compatible with each other, similar to the rooster crying. They're not mutually exclusive, both could happen, right? It's possible that Judas went, hung himself, wasn't actually super great at it, fell from the tree, bow, hit his head, bowels gushed out. Yeah, not great. Uh, anyway, however, there's a second part which is super interesting, which is uh, Matthew says, of course, uh, that when uh, Judas, he threw the silver into the temple, uh, saying, hey, you know what, I don't want anything to do with this anymore. And so they're like, well, what do we do? We can't put this money in the treasury because it's blood money. So they decided to do something else with it. And they took council and brought, bought with them, the silver, the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. And then it became known as the field of blood. While Acts, on the other hand, says this man acquired for himself a field with the reward for his wickedness. <laughs> so what is going on, right? Did Judas himself purchase the field of blood that uh, is, is then known, or did the chief priest do it? Um, and this kind of gets a little bit into, uh, the best explanation I have for this, gets into the word choice, specific word choice, um, in the Greek. So, in Acts, the word choice for bought um, is this Greek word, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's like, exeto, something like that. I, you know that, it's right on that. Yeah, I know that, okay. <laughs> um, and that can mean to acquire, to win purchase, buy, possess, or win mastery over. While the other word that's used in Matthew for bought is used exclusively to convey purchasing or buying something, transactional. Um, it has no concept of winning something as a reward. However, it is interesting because both words are used um, in the gospel as like, for example, Jesus purchased us with his blood. Um, so they're used to buy meta, they're both can be used to buy metaphorical things. Um, at the same time, one is only used for a specific transaction, whereas another, AKA Jesus had to have given up something <laughs> to win us. Whereas, uh, in, in this particular case for the, uh, in Acts, um, I believe Luke is talking more metaphorically about, uh, Judas acquiring for himself the field of blood, a.k.a. as a reward for his wickedness, he acquired the field of blood by falling headlong into it and bursting open. <laughs> um, pretty not great. Um, it's a way of purchasing land. Yeah, it is a very interesting <laughs> way of purchasing land. Of course, uh, it's notable that both Matthew and Acts talk about this, this place as a field of blood. 
Um, and really, it wasn't simply known as the field of blood. It was known as a, by a single word. Um, so you have this very interesting story where not only is there a bit of a scandal going on with this blood money silver and the, the chief priest purchasing this field as a place uh, for burial for strangers, but also Judas, the man who betrayed Jesus, hanging himself. And so you have these two different events and two different perspectives coming together to give you a reason for why it was known locally just by this one word. Um, yeah. Very so would you say then... The way I would look at it is he acquired it not with the money, he acquired it with the sins that he committed. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, essentially his efforts of betraying Jesus and killing himself <laughs> basically meant that the field was named after him. <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions about that? Cool. Well, we'll go on to the next one. All right, so this is our last one. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. I love this. Um, I did a sermon in um, Zambia when I went there last summer, and this is one of my topic was. It's just super fun as a theology nerd. You guys probably don't think it's as much fun as me, but I'll try to make it exciting. <laughs> um, so I think most of us, if we just read a Bible, have kind of seen this seeming contradiction as well, right? And so God, can God change his mind? If he's truly omnipotent and omniscient and he knows all things, why do we see so many verses where it looks like God is changing his mind? So similar to my approach on the last one, I'm going to do that here as well. Um, Numbers 23.19 says, God is not a human being that he should lie or immoral that he should change his mind. So in Numbers it says right away, God can't change his mind. All right. Um, and then um, in... Exodus 32, I'll actually read that one because I think this is a good one that we all kind of know. Um, this is a story of the golden calf. Um, when, I'm just going to paraphrase, I'm sure most of us are familiar with it. It's when um, Moses was up on Mount um, Sinai and talking to God, getting the Ten Commandments and everything like that, and the um, Israelites were down at the bottom, and Moses was gone for like a month, and they decide, well, let's just serve another God, basically. And, um, they, they start worshiping this golden calf that Aaron had made for them, and God is rightfully very upset about this, right? Um, idolatry is a big deal, and he says to, um, to Moses, basically, I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna kill these people, and we're gonna restart the line with you. Um, many theologians on the side note have said, well, God actually wasn't doing that there because that would be evil, which I don't think we should ever ascribe evil to God, um, and then they would say, that he couldn't have done that because the line had to come from Abraham. But um, that's actually a very poor argument because Moses came from Abraham's line, so he would still have a line from Abraham there. God very much could have done this, and he would have been just in doing so. Um, however, then uh, Moses makes an appeal to God and says, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven in this land that I promised to give you to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And then uh, it says, and then the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on the people. So God changed his mind, did he not change his mind. Um, we have Jonah as well, everyone's very familiar with that story. So um, basically Jonah goes, people think it was sometimes they get this wrong that Jonah was going to tell them to repent so that God won't destroy them. That's not the story. Jonah was actually going to go tell them you guys are going to die. You know? And then um, what happens is they do repent and then God does have grace on them and changes his mind. All right. Small distinction, but very important. Did God change his mind? Did he not? Um, so, this is why I love this, because of the theology and the philosophy behind this. So I think uh, Thomas Aquinas, if you ever heard that name, he's a great theologian and philosopher, had the best answer to this. So, he said there's a difference between positive and conditional will. This goes back to the incommunicable attributes of God, that he's much greater than us and he knows everything. Uh, we do not know everything, and we are much smaller than God. So we can't really understand what it's like for God to communicate this attribute to us. All right? So we would expect there to be some sort of disconnect. And then on top of that, if God is going to communicate how he changes his mind or doesn't change his mind, he must do it in human terms, because we're human. Right? We can't understand this if he's going to talk to us. Like, like a, you know, if a, I'm an accountant, if I talk to 
maybe Sam's son about, you know, how I'm a CPA at work and I work with balance sheets and income statements, he would have no idea what I'm talking about, right? So I'd have to talk to him at the level saying, I do math and I add and I subtract. That would make sense. God does the same thing to us, right? Otherwise, we don't understand it. So when he does this, Aquinas points out that God has a positive and a conditional will, okay? Uh, Aquinas was a big believer in free will, just kind of like we are as well, at least it sounds like he is in a lot of his writing. Um, he would say God's positive will is the will that he has planned for everything, right? Um, God's positive will is that we all come to him through, through Jesus Christ, right? So that Jesus would die for our sins, and these sorts of things are fixed. And he would say that he also has a conditional will that appears to change based on the free will of others, right? So the best analogy, I think, for this is Another father and son analogy. These analogies go well with, uh, you know, the father, our father in heaven, and us on earth. But they say that's a warning bell, isn't it? I believe so. Okay. Yes. Cool. Sweet. <laughs> so almost done. Doesn't really matter that much. But um, so let's say there's a father, and he's saying to his son, um, he found out his son stole something. Let's say he stole a, a little toy bike from his, his friend. And the father comes to him and says, "I'm going to spank you, and I'm going to punish you." And then I'm going to take that and I'm going to give it back to the other kid. But then the son clearly repents and says, you know, I'm sorry, I really, I didn't know it was wrong or whatever, and I'm not going to do it again. The father then says to the son, um, you know, thank you for saying that, I forgive you, and we're going to go super sorry to the kid and we're going to give back the bike. Did the father really change his mind in that situation? No, right? He always wanted, his ultimate goal was that the son would change his mind, right, and, and react within the positive will of the father. Mm -hmm. So it looked like, from the son's perspective, that the dad changed his mind, that he wasn't going to spank him and punish him. But in reality, the dad never really changed his mind. Right? He always had his positive will. So this is a great one to apply to the Jonah story. So if we see that, it's God's positive will was that the people of Nineveh would not act wickedly. It wasn't that I'm going to destroy these people, so that I want these people to repent and come to me. So when they did, he had grace on them, and his positive will never change. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> in the reality, God did not change his mind. It only appeared he changed his mind according to our perspective. Yeah. All right. Another big fancy term that uh, theologians use is called anthropo or anthro anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. That yeah. one. <laughs> Which means explaining something that is not human in human terms. Right, we do this dogs all the time. So, like, this dog loves us. The dog doesn't really love you. He loves the thing that you give him, right? So, <laughs> wow. I won't write that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dog doesn't go to heaven either, so. That's <laughs> <laughs> me. Yeah. So, um, the, the key point to this that we can really take home is that when God changed his mind, he did it on prayer, which is really interesting. Right? He did it to Moses when Moses prayed, and he did it in Jonah when Jonah prayed, and there's other examples as well. Yeah. So, like Abraham, for example. Like Abraham, yep. Yeah. So, the key is, if those people didn't pray, what would have happened? I mean, God probably would have carried out his will as it was, right? Mm -hmm. So this conditional will is a very important thing, and God listens to us. That's very important as well. Yeah. Um, I think I put a verse up here that says, um, when uh, one will not listen to the law, even one's prayers are abomination. Don't have quite time to get into that, but this does seem to suggest that uh, the effectiveness of prayer does change with maybe something like sanctification or a process as we become more like Christ. So it's very important for us as we grow in our relationship with Christ that we are praying because you would expect as our relationship grows with him that prayer actually does in some way become more effective. Um, I wish I could get into that more, but we don't have time. So. Um, and then another thing about that is if our prayers are not answered, we should look at Jesus. And when Jesus prayed before he went to the cross, he said, uh, uh, may this cup be taken from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And uh, Jesus' will was not done there, right? The Father's will was done. He went on the cross and died. So if sometimes God's will is greater than our own. It's our job to submit to him and um, take that. So. Cool. Any Does questions there? On? If you want another argument. Yeah. So if he says, not my will, but yours be done, isn't the Father and the Son the same? Aren't yeah, you? I know. The Trinity is an awesome one. I would love <laughs> yeah. to get in that one, too. But, yeah, the, I mean, that is a very interesting one, that we seem to have contrary wills between the same God. Just like, man. Well, and that's also an interesting thing, right? Jesus was human, so was his 
human yeah. desires <laughs> contrary <laughs> as well. So yeah. it was just human will. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So yeah, the Christology and the Trinity there as well. So cool. And then uh, yeah, next week we're going to go over Mormons and JWs. So. Yeah, are they Christian? Are they not Christian? What do they believe about the Bible? What do they believe? What external uh, to the Bible beliefs do they have? Um, what's a good way to witness to them? Because like a JW, for example, you're gonna approach that very differently from how you would approach a Mormon, for mm -hmm. example. So also um, really practical applications of where do we draw the line between Christianity and exactly. non-Christianity, right? Exactly. Because we do have to draw the line somewhere. We can't just say everyone's Christian. Yeah. So, so there we go. Yeah. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>